And my name is, uh, is Pastor Rick, and uh, not really. Pastor Rick, um, he's sick. He calls me Saturday morning, and he sounds terrible. He's got a fever, and uh, he's like, oh, buddy, oh, pal. And I'm like, yeah, Saturday, um, we lose an hour. Yeah, sure, I'll cover your back, absolutely. But be praying for Pastor Rick. He is, um, he's not feeling well. He's been battling the same stuff that goes on, the head and chest, and has a, a fever as well. So I know he's not feeling good, but um, love the woke series that we're in. I'm a guy that does not always have um, maybe high <laughs> intellect and spiritual maturity. So I love it when we put the cookies down on the bottom shelf so that we can all get to those and learn and apply things. And Pastor Rick has been doing that right in this series, woke, not how you might define woke. We're redefining that in a way that says, hey, let's come alive, let's engage. And so we've talked about some spiritual disciplines, right? We've talked about how to take some time to pray. We've walked through what that looks like and how to read uh, the Bible, God's word, and, and walking through those practical little checklists. We've heard a lot of interaction with that. And I do, I enjoy that so much. And I love that you're taking some steps there with that. Um, and then today we're talking about uh, passing the test of endurance. So let me ask this question. With the things we've talked about when it comes to spiritual disciplines, those things that make us, uh, grow us in our faith, broad room to respond here. So have you taken or tried one of those steps, one of those action points, or have you thought about it? Come on, anybody? With the actions of spiritual discipline, Bible reading, praying, engaging people last week, right? Those people that God has put before us. And he walked through um, schedule consistency, contract creatively, and observe carefully. So hopefully you're taking some very easy steps, not to accomplish everything, but just take a step. So today, like I said, we're talking about passing the test of endurance. Oh, endurance, resolve. How many of you um, like to run? Like run's fun for you. You like to run? Had a guy who ran some big time stuff back in the day. Griffin, you like to run. I'm glad to see that. Um, most kids run to our kids ministry all the time. It's wonderful. But I don't get anyone who likes to run. Do you? I mean, I, they call it a runner's high. When I've ran, playing both basketball, starting in probably sixth or seventh grade till past college, I've ran thousands of miles. I've never had a runner's high in my life. I've had runner's anxiety. My lungs burn like crazy. My heart, I can see it in my chest. It's like, what in the world are you doing, Shao? Stop. Um, I hate running. I can't fathom why some people love to run. And Dan, you don't understand. You just got to do it long enough. I'm like, I've done thousands of miles and I never enjoyed running. And knowing that, I'll give you a little story, trying to be you know, transparent and vulnerable with you. When I committed to go play basketball at Liberty University, I knew myself well enough to know that I, maybe you've heard it, I hate to run. So I said to myself, self, you're going to get your booty in line and you're going to run. In fact, I've never been a part of the track team, but I'm going to be a part of the track team, right? I'm going to force myself to run, to practice. I get there and um, coach says, Shows, you have long legs. You'd be great for the 400. I'm like, I'm thinking more of a sprint. Do it, done, over, right? He's like, no, it's 400. One time around the lap, you know, the track, one, just one lap. I'm like, okay, I, I could do one lap. But that wasn't the whole truth. Because when you go to practice to run the one lap, you usually run two. That's stinking half a mile. You could die. <laughs> two laps around the track. One particular time, I will never forget. I am younger than Rick, much younger. I'm only 52. He's like almost 54. And um, we went to the same high school together. And we'll just end that there. There's other stories for other places. But um, this one particular time, my youth leader took some of us out of school. And we went on this trip. And I knew that I was going to miss track practice. So our leader took us to Pizza Hut. Do you remember the Pizza Hut buffet? Back in the day, I could put you out of business if you had a, if you had a buffet. I mean, I was 6'5", a buck oh five. I could eat an elephant and not gain an ounce. I miss those days. And I, I, I left nothing on the table. I ate so much, I literally felt like cheese was oozing out of my orifices, right? So I get back, the van's dropping us back at school, and I know I've missed it. So I'm going to sneak in my car and take off. 17, senior year, I'm out of here, except Coach Ruloffs is there. He's like, hey, Shouse, good to see you. Get ready for track practice. 
Not a good day. Not a good day. In Memphis, Tennessee, I remember a few things. It was hot that day. It was hot. And I wasn't full. I was overwhelmed with full, right? So we start running, doing our practices. It's hot. I, I've never had the world spin before, but that day I remember it was spinning. It was spinning so bad. My coach loved me so much. He didn't say, hey, Dan, you're not feeling good. Let's sit down. He said, no, Scott, get in front of Dan, run in front of him so he can figure out where he's going. That's how bad it was. And I have a superpower that I'm going to share with you and you can't share with anybody else, even online audience. I can't throw up. I know, right? Like I, and I, that day... I was like, I've got to put my superpower aside. And I, I went up on the hill and I tried everything that I heard you crazy wrestlers do to lose weight and I couldn't do it. That was one of the most miserable days of my life. So not only do I hate running, I remember that day at track practice and I <laughs> resent it even more so. But that example is a little bit like life. I mean, that prepared me to grow. It prepared me to endure. It prepared me to play at the next division one level. And life does that, right? I mean, we can all talk a good game. We can all talk that we have life together. But how you respond to life, that's what you and I really believe. I want us to look at a verse, um, Hebrews 12. You'll find it funny, especially the last part of that. It's a part Pastor Rick shared with us at the beginning of the year. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, Pastor Rick talked about this sort of a motivation for the beginning of 2024. And those cloud of witnesses are those people who've gone before us and have modeled um, a Christian faith. They've done it well, right? They entered heaven saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. So that could be from scripture. It could be from family, from godly people that you know. He said, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Like, I don't know, Pizza Hut buffet pizza. Just saying. Um, and then here's where we're at. Let us run with perseverance or endurance. The same word. The race marked out for us. Now, sometimes track is like real life, is it not? You have some wins. You get through the race. Sometimes you feel like you want to go up on the hill and try to relieve yourself. And um, that's just how life works. Let me ask you a couple of questions if, if you're not tied into me yet. Um, how many of you love school? Like maybe you were in school, maybe you are in school, anybody? I'm at a corner of my eye, I can see teenagers turning around like, who are you people? Yeah, some of you guys love school. I don't understand that either. I had to work at school. I had to figure out how to get myself motivated. Anybody more like that? Like school didn't make sense to us. Yeah, a lot of guys are that way. Like we just don't get the teaching. We need to do something with our hands or break something or burn something, right? So some people, it comes easy. Some people have some wins. For some of us, um, school is hard. It just wasn't simple. Um, how about um, being a parent? Or, or maybe you've been a niece or nephew hung around with kids. They're awesome when they're born. It's like every little animal. Every little animal is beautiful when it's born, right? I, I don't have, Lori and I have no animals, none, because we're empty nesters. So we don't have birds, which I've had. We don't have cats. We don't have dogs. We have nothing. But everything when it's little is really cool until it grows up. How about your two-year-old? How about your teenager? Let me ask you a question. Did you rock it as a parent every time? I'm guessing no is somewhere in that response. So do you quit or you just keep going on? Sometimes you have wins. Sometimes you, you fail. But just like life, whether it's fair, whether it's not easy, where it makes no sense, we just keep going. I want to talk about um, an example from scripture, a guy named Abraham. In Genesis 22, it gives us a little picture. And it says this um, in verse one, sometime later, God tested Abraham, which happens, tested his faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, because this is not the first time he heard the voice of God. They had been in relationship and conversation long before this. So yes, he replied, here I am. God says, take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. That sounds morbid. And while it looks that way, we both know the outcome was not the case. God was 
testing Abraham, who is the father of our Jewish culture, now our Christian uh, life, he was testing the most precious thing he had. And, and Abraham, when this goes on, the very next verse said, and Abraham woke up the next morning, he saddled his donkey, he got his buddies together, took his son, and literally it says he chopped wood. I, I, I don't understand that. My, my response would be like, um, I, I didn't hear you. Something got mixed up in the translation. S sacrifice the son. You know, Old Testament, they sacrificed all the time. I mean, killing and bloodshed was part of the covenant. It was normal. We don't get that because that always happens in a slaughterhouse somewhere, but it's perfectly normal. But now a, a human, like God's never done that. This is weird. And, and Abraham looks like he's got it all together. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, that's not me. I get questions, I've got concerns. But don't forget, I look at you guys from the stage and you look good, you're all dressed up. Some of you actually took a shower. You got your hair combed. If I leaned in, you probably smell nice. You guys have it all together. I'm gonna screw up, right? That's what we think in our mind. And we look at Abraham and think, man, Abraham's got it all together. I don't have faith like that, but Let's remember the whole story, shall we? Abraham, when um, he's talking with God, because this is not the first time he talked with God, God is telling him, hey, I'm going to bless you and your future generation. I'm gonna do something that's just, you're gonna change the world. And he goes on in this conversation and says to Abraham, and you're gonna have a son, except Abraham is literally 100 years old. His wife's in his 90s. And scripture says, and he knelt and laughed to himself in disbelief. Now, I've got this word picture. I'm a Star Wars guy, like, you know, Darth Vader, like you laughed, I'm going to squeak, you know, but that's not what happened because God's a good God. He's a gracious God, but it notes, Abraham laughed, so did his wife. Not laugh, laugh's not the sin, it's the disbelief because God had shown him time and time again. So maybe Abraham isn't as perfect as I think he is. Maybe I can connect with this guy. And then he does something else that I've never done, so I can sit in judgment, right? He, um, he has a wife and the Bible literally says, not my version, it says, and she was beautiful. Um, she was a hottie, she was gorgeous. And they start in the land of Egypt and good old Abraham says, hey, hun, you're hot. And in our culture, the king can grab whatever woman he wants. So let's do this. Let's just tell him you're my sister so I don't get killed. Sure, great plan, right? <laughs> so the king, of course, hears about this beautiful girl. He says, hey, come to my palace. And he gets struck with plagues, his whole household. And he gets, the, the king is revealed, this is not, he's, she's married. He goes to Abraham and basically says, what's the deal, man? You were about, you've worn me out. And he said, here, take this, take this. And basically booted him out of the country. Then he has the whole Sodom and Gomorrah with Lot, right? The whole town's about to get burned up and his nephew Lot's there. Abraham comes in to sort of help save the day. And then Abraham does the same thing again with the king Abimelech. He comes back the second time, not the first time. He didn't learn his lesson and says, hey, hon, you know, you're hot. So let's just do this thing again. So if people like ask, you're my sister, not my wife. Weird, hadn't done that. So guess what? Abimelech has a dream. God says, dude, that ain't your wife. It's Abraham's wife and your kingdom is done. And the next morning, scripture says, literally the next morning he goes and confronts Abraham. Dude, what are you doing? He gives him stuff and says, okay, find a place and get out of here, but take your wife back. That's twice he did something sort of dumb. Maybe I can connect with Abraham. And then... The last thing that, that Abraham did that I find, again, something that I can sort of connect with is when he laughs about having a son, right? You can't have a generation unless you have a son that continues to have a generation, right? <clears throat> so it takes time. In other words, I know you maybe like me, God moves so fast in your life. Sometimes it's hard to wait, but God usually moves a whole lot slower than I want him to. And so what does Abraham do because he can't seem to, to, have, uh, to get Sarah pregnant. So they both come up with the idea for him to sleep with a servant girl. Anybody wanna finish the rest of that story? How do you think that's gonna work out? So Hagar does get pregnant 
And now Hagar feels like she's better than Sarah and Sarah despises Hagar. There's some family dynamics going on. I think I can connect with this Abraham. He's not as perfect as I thought he was, but here's what I want you to take away here. Abraham didn't do it perfectly. At first glance, it looks that way, but here's what he did do. He just kept going. He just kept going. He didn't stop. He didn't give up. Sure, he messed up. Obviously, he messed up. But, but when you're a follower of Jesus and you define that finish line is to be like him, like it's not up and to the right. Everything is not perfect, wonderful, and a bluebird on your shoulder. Life happens. And I skip and I miss and I mess up and I respond in my actions and my thoughts. But you just keep going. So in the past, uh, the, to pass a test of endurance, really what we're talking about is hardship. That season of your life that has been fearful and hard and hurtful, we might even call it, you know, the worst season. We may call it a dark season of the soul. We may call it a nightmare. You call it what you want to, but you know what I'm talking about. Either you've been there, you could be in it now, or you will be in it. It's called real life. And how do we handle this as a follower of Jesus? This growth in our spiritual discipline. Well, you and I both know we don't grow by just reading something or listening to something or popping a pill. We do. Uh, Rick was, you know, saying he was sick and I quoted Romans 8, 28 to him very sarcastically, which says, hey, God works all things out for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now I knew he couldn't get close enough to hit me through the phone, but that's what churches do. They quote scripture and they quote it because you're you have the need, but they don't live it out in their own lives, which is why I say you can talk about this all you want to, but talk is cheap. It's how you respond when life gets hard. So, so let me just debunk some things that are churchy, right? First of all, again, being transparent, I have struggled most of my life being a pastor's kid um, that God only blesses those who walk nearly perfect like Jesus. Again, you guys have it all together. You look good. You, you smell good. Your hair looks nice. Most of you get hair, um, but I'm not. And if you knew my struggles, if you knew my fear, if you need some of the lies in my head, like you wouldn't understand, but that's what goes on. And I've struggled with that perfectionistic tendency. I'm wired that way anyway, to be perfect. My dad modeled Christ so good. He's my hero. And I'm so far from Jesus and my dad. I stink, <laughs> but I'm not careful. I just go into a survival mode and, and I'm barely making it, but I am making it. Let me remind you, other than Jesus, Jesus, Joseph, and Job, everybody else in scripture screwed up and usually multiple times, just like Abraham. So you and I are in good company. That's the truth. Second, when you're going through these hard, hurtful, fearful times, what if you don't do it right? What if you don't do it right? Here's what I know to be true. God gets context. Okay, so if your kid gets in trouble, what's the first thing you ask? Like, what happened, right? You want to know context. Now, if you were old school, like some of us were, you just got a whooping and then they ask, but now they usually ask, like, okay, with context. Okay, so God reminds us, if you as parents usually ask for that, that fails, you're earthly, I'm God, you're good, I'm God. I understand context even more. So what if you and I don't do it right? Hey, here's a reality. It has so many variables. There's no way you can track and do the same thing. The roadmap is not the same for all of us. So the encouragement is just keep going. God gives grace so much further than you can fathom. Just keep going. What if, Pastor Dan, I have serious doubts when I'm going through the hard hurtful seasons, like I don't even believe in God. Welcome to the club. It's where real life and real faith collide. Again, you can talk and quote scripture and go to city group or go to small group or lead this, but talking is one thing. The way you respond to this dark season, the soul is what you really believe. And sometimes we do it well, and sometimes we don't do it well. But those seasons that we question actually help us dig deeper. And it grows our faith and it solidifies us. 
So what if I do some bad things in this season? Pastor Dan, you don't understand. Oh, I do. In my season of being bad, I was bad. I was ticked at God to use a nice expression. Fair didn't measure up. He didn't do anything fair for 20 years. And I'll share a little bit my story a little bit later, but I did some bad things. I mean, like really bad. If you look in the Old Testament, in the Bible and the New Testament, you will find men and women of God who have done far worse things than you. And yet God, and yet God still forgives according to 1 John 1, 9, still gives grace, still gives mercy. So with all that happens and all that takes place, is it, are you just saying, Dan, everything's gonna be okay? No, no, li listen, here's, here's what I want you to hear. Suffering always changes us. Suffering always changes us. There's two choices. It makes me better, it makes me softer and more mature. Not perfectly, but passionately pursuing that. Or it makes you bitter, makes you hard, and makes you repel God. I've had a dime for every conversation that said, Dan, you don't understand. Back when I was, I prayed for, I don't care if it was your grandma, your dog, something happened. And I mean that in a serious, sometimes it's very serious. Sometimes I almost want to laugh thinking like your pigeon died. Like that's why you're mad at God. But in your world, it's real. We don't have to have the same experience to go through these dark seasons. In your world, God didn't do what you think he ought to. So you and I have a choice. How do we pass, uh, pass the test of endurance? Um, it's not something simple and easy. It's hard. It's called endurance. It's just like my track day. <laughs> but our choice is, I want to see God. I want to be humbled by God. I want to be softer now. And there are plenty of people in church. Hear me, this is not just for in church and not church. There's plenty of people in church that go through the motions who are bitter at God. Pastors, missionaries, Sunday school, small group leaders, people who attend church. This is not for somebody out on, online. This is true of all of us. So in this season that you're reminding yourself right now of some things that's happened in the past, or maybe you're in that season now, you've got a choice to make. And do a true evaluation. Am I softer? Am I softer? Not that you're perfect, but have you kept on going that you can mark that I'm different now than I was back here? And if you're honest, and if you're real honest, and ask people that are close to you, are you hard, bitter, protective, controlling and manipulative? Because I'm not gonna let God do that to me ever again. I wanna pray for us, and I wanna come back after we sing, and I wanna share with you some of the how-tos to pass this test of endurance. But I want to set the stage. This is not some little churchy thing. This is real life. <laughs> Happens to all of us. And I want you to keep on going. We're going to have a time of singing. You can sit and just listen, be quiet. You can participate, whatever you want to do. I'll have some friends down here front, our prayer team, or just some folks that'll be happy to pray with you. Maybe you're in that season right now and you just need somebody <laughs> to say, uh, you know, I'm lost, I'm hurt, I'm mad, I'm angry, I'm confused. <laughs> That's what we're here for. Maybe this is conjuring up thoughts like I said of the past and you just want someone to pray for, this is what these men and women are up here to do, just to pray for you, to love you, to um, sort of bear your burden with you, if you will. And then I'm gonna come back up and uh, we're gonna close up this next session. Let me pray for us. Let's, um, walk through some practical application. How do we pass this uh, test of endurance? Meaning when real life happens, when hardship comes, hurtful times come, fearful uncertainty happens. Just define it how you, how you want. But we're talking about spiritual growth and we know that our muscles are grown in the time of tension and time of uncertainty. That's why it's called faith. <laughs> and not fact. So a couple things. How do we pass the test of endurance? First, 
Look back at God's faithfulness. Now, I want to remind you, I think Pastor Rick and I try to do this fairly often. Um, we're not preaching or teaching at you. We, we <laughs> live this out, own these principles, do it in our marriage, do it in our personal lives, do it with our kids and our grandkids. So this is not at you, it is with you. Um, Brian, of course, does a great job leading specials. I mean, he's a professional singer. He's got a hilarious, Brian Heron, a hilarious story. He's a state college wrestler turned opera singer. You know, like every wrestler does, right? Turn into an opera singer. And he mentioned the first service. Um, he said, you know, and maybe he did here. I was a little distracted, but um, how life gets so busy. And this is why we call a timeout. It's why Pastor Rick is walking through this woke series of engaging again and talking with God called prayer and reading our scripture. It's taking a time out so we don't get caught up in the busy. If you stay busy, it's a good to great principle. You, you miss what God is doing or importantly here has done. So first thing is looking back at God's faithfulness. Abraham had a whole life that he looked back and time and time again saw God's faithfulness. We know he did it, he shared it. Of course, his wife, his family. And I've got to tell you, this is weird because again, Rick, Pastor Rick is sick. And so I didn't know I was preaching a sermon until like, you know, 24 hours ago with one hour less of sleep. Don't think I'm not going to let, lovingly let him live that down. But um, Brady, Lori and I's middle son, that's a Missouri State Trooper, um, he called um, last week, week, week before last, about 10 days ago. And he's 26. Remember being 20? Some of you aren't there yet, but some of us, a lot of us in this room remember what it was like to be in our mid-20s. And this kind of conversation is what every parent wants to have. And, and Brady's calling up, talking about what he's done, but he's talking about like, dad, what's, what do you think next? And here's what I'm thinking. Um, what if we did this? What if I did this? What if we move? What if we do? What if we try, right? And as a parent, man, I'm just soaking this conversation in. And he's like a 20, he's just, you're just dreaming with him, right? I mean, it's an awesome conversation. Every parent wants to have, of course, you want that when you're a kid. But when you get older, that's the kind of thing you want to stay in relationship for. And I've got to tell you again, not that this was prepared, but it just happened. And I'm not preaching at you, I'm with you, that as Brady was wrestling with all these things, uh, I had to go back <laughs> and recount our life. And our life was not what I had planned. I'm a Southern boy, you guys know this. Iowa is my hell. 30 below zero is hell, 115 in Memphis, that's fine. And if you don't know my story, I'll give you the brief cliff note version, but um, my dad's a pastor, both uncle pastors, we're known for ministry and family. <laughs> no one's been divorced in our family. And after 18 years of leading churches and ministries, I find myself in a divorce I did not want in a place I did not want to be called the Quad Cities in Iowa. And of course, Brady is long for the ride. And I think God screwed up because this was not my plan. And I'm good at forecasting. I'm good at implementing. I'm an administrator for a reason. And I'm telling Brady, son, I never wanted you to grow up in Iowa. I never wanted you to graduate from North Scott and Eldridge. I never wanted you to go to some university I never heard of called Western Illinois. That happens to be one of the leading law enforcement degrees in the country. And son, you're a Missouri State Trooper. I would have never planned this life out for you. And yet God did. It's unmistakable. I, I would love to tell you this was my plan. This is how I did it. But God worked in such a crazy way that I can't ignore it. So I'm literally reciting this, not to you, to my flesh and blood who I want him to live out his calling as a man of God, as a husband of God and a future father. So I am not preaching at you. <laughs> I am preaching with you. This stuff works. 
How do we overcome the test of endurance? Look back and remind yourself how good God has been. You can't get credit, not for all the variables. Second thing, this sounds simple, but it's so simple, it's profound. Just do the next right thing. Just do the next right thing. When God first called Abraham and had the big conversation and said, hey, Abraham, I'm gonna take you away from a, from a country, sounds familiar, that, that you grew up in, that you know, that you're familiar with, and you're gonna leave or you're gonna go to Canaan and I'm gonna make you a father. And I mean, he just spills his vision to Abraham and Abraham's like, the next verse is, and he grabbed his family, grabbed his stuff and left. What else? I don't know. He just did the next right thing. And I say the right thing because the right thing has to be done the right way in the right timing. I can't do things out of animosity. That's not right. It's not godly. It's not loving. I'm a follower of Jesus. The next right thing has to line it with scripture, has to line it with God's heart, with Christ's example. And interesting with Abraham and Isaac, he says, you know, do this thing. Like, I'm going to give you this illustration. I'm going to ask you to sound something weird, like really crazy. Go sacrifice your son. Who does that? That sounds crazy. And Abraham has spent a lifetime at this point in time watching God do his thing and verse three literally says, and Abraham got up early the next morning, saddled his donkeys, grabbed his helpers and his son and chopped wood for the sacrifice. What do you do when God says something as crazy as that? What about, what about the road to Moriah? I mean, that's where he wanted it. Can you imagine what was going on in his head? Hebrews gives us, because Abraham is one of the leading, we call hall of faith in Hebrews in the New Testament. And it reminds us that Abraham somewhere on this walk is thinking, I've watched God do things time and time again, and he's a good God. He would never do this. And it, it gives the example that, that David says, or David, that Abraham says that he believes that even if he asks me to kill my son, God will raise him from the dead. Does that sound familiar? A little foreshadowing of when God sends his son, Jesus. Listen, God always has plan. We may not see it in the moment, but I promise you, he always has the plan. So just do the next right thing. And then the next right thing will be presented and the next right thing. And while I want to know what step 30 is, just do the next right thing. And before you know, you can look in the rearview mirror and realize you have covered miles just by doing the next right thing that God puts before you. And the last thing is entrust him with the future. This is hard for me to say because I'm a preparer and dare I say perfectionistic kind of a guy and I'm good at forecasting. And if I'm not careful, I can control and manipulate. So trust him with the future. Your future, sure. I'll tell you what to do, but I've got to entrust God with my future, my sons, my stepson, my grandkids. Yes, your kids, your grandkids, your job, your finances, your retirement. Yes, why? Because he's good and he can be trusted. He's proven it time and time again. And if you don't believe it, listen to my story and let that hope fill you. That's one reason this is a church. It's not a building, it's doing this. And we're sharing real life and real faith. Though even when you're weak, I'm sharing a story, a true story, a personal story that says, Dan, that sounds crazy. How did you do it? I don't know. I just did the next right thing. Were you ever ticked at God? You better believe it. I said some bad, naughty things to God. And yet, and yet, God defines mercy in such a bigger way than I can define for you. And when I entrust him with the future, there's a, there's a principle in 2 Corinthians that says, it's, it, some people think it's a cliche, but it's not in scripture, that we as followers of Jesus walk by faith and not by sight. Because you can trust God with every aspect. When I want to control and manipulate, you know what I miss? I miss the variables. <laughs> you know those God things that only God knows is gonna happen? And as much as my default mode is to control and manipulate, and I'm not talking selfishly, I'm talking about helping people. I want to fix everybody's problem. I just wish I'd tell God, if I had a cape, I could help more people. And then life happens. 
And then I realize, oh yeah, God says, you're not me, are you? And I'm like, no, but I take your place if I'm not careful. And I want to control and manipulate, not to be selfish, rich or whatever. I want to help. I want to fix your marriage, your kids, your grandkids. But I'm not God, but I know him. You hear me? I know him. And I've looked back and I know him to be true. And I don't know all that you need to do, but I do know that you need to do this one next thing. Just do that next thing and God Trust him. You can. He's good. He's trustworthy. And, and I know it, there's three principles and it sounds like something from a you know, Chinese place you pull out with a you know, deal there to talk about your fortune, but it's just true, guys. And my heart and prayer is that if we're going to grow, which means real life is going to happen, you've got to learn to just keep on going. Not perfectly, just passionately with, with perseverance, with endurance, just keep on going. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, you define the finish line, you know where you're going. You know, Rick and his family are super smart, super smart. Like his dad and mom both have PhDs. So smart, I can't fathom it. His dad's one of the leading Greek professors in the world. He writes commentaries. Rick is just as smart, even though he wouldn't tell you that. Um, I, I don't under understand how smart they are. Just not how I'm wired. And uh, Rick and I are talking, which we do every single week, um, about personally, you know, accountability. We talk about the church lives. We're, it's, we're shepherds just trying to model the things and then anticipate and try to help and grow and point you to Jesus. But Rick knows my story. He was on the front row. He was one of my inner circle guys. And I just told him one day in this season of endurance and as smart as Rick is, I said, Rick, you know, I know you can define grace, right? Giving me what I don't deserve. And, and I know you can define mercy, not giving me what I do deserve. But I'm telling you, you know me, Rick. However way you define it, it's wider. It's wider. And I don't mean that as like a free-for-all. I mean that as overwhelming. His love for you and I blows me away. And I choose to be better. I choose to be softer. I realize it's got nothing to do with me. I should not be here, should not be in this marriage, should not be in this next season of life, should not be, should not be. No way, it doesn't add up. Apart from God's goodness and grace. Recall how good God has been in your life. Trust him with the next right thing. And you can trust him with your life, your kid's life, your finances, your job. He will do the work. And that is how he passed the test of endurance. Not perfectly, but persistently keep on going. Let me pray for you. God, it's a heavy message when we talk about hard times and suffering. And I pray that as we've spoken, maybe some examples, some illustrations from your story of Abraham's life, from his faith that was remarkable and his faith that was lacking just like mine, that those things will connect with people today. And Lord, someone here needs to be reminded that even though they may not walk perfectly, if they're a follower of Jesus, they continue just to walk with you one step at a time. Lord, I'm, I'm just reminded if someone here is just sort of trying this out, maybe watching online and they've never become a fully devoted follower of Christ that Romans 10, 13 in a very simple way says, whoever calls in the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. <laughs> Understanding that God sent Jesus to pay for all of our shortcomings, to give us a promise of eternity and a purpose for this life. And for my friends who are followers, the enemy likes nothing better than to knock us down, cause disillusionment, fear, anxiety that keeps us in a survival mode. And you have created us in a thriving mode. So may the words of truth today get past the ears 
And may the Spirit plant that deep within their heart to live it out. In Jesus' name, amen.